Okay, great. Well, I, uh, uh, I thank you all uh, for being such an incredibly well-disciplined and punctual group. Uh, I don't even have to like wave my hand. Everybody's like, oh, it's two, let's go back in. So, um, so we are gonna catch back up on the agenda. Um, and uh, I commend all the morning presentations. They're all really, really, really interesting. And so we're just uh, thinking about the task of pulling all this material together. There's just so much interesting data. Uh, and we will continue now with the presentation by Sergio Trindade, who is the Director for Science and Technology at International Fuel Technologies, Inc. And Sergio is uh, asked and speaks in many international forum on the subject at hand today. <coughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, like first to thank the organizers for inviting me to be with you today. I'd like to uh, begin by saying that uh, I, I, I believe, uh, like in many other things in life, uh, we need to uh, check from time to time uh, where we stand and where are we going. And that can be sometimes uh, summarized as, uh, as the mindset. So what is the mindset? The mindset is that not each of us individually, but I think all of us collectively in the United States are dependent on oil. We have security concerns. We have uh, somehow decided, or it was decided for us that we live in urban, suburban sprawls. We, some of us, uh, commute to work. Uh, we prefer road, uh, we ignore rail. Uh, we prefer to move by ourselves. We don't like to travel together with too many people in buses or trams. We, are, we have a culture of energy waste. I don't remember ever, ever seeing anyone in the United States turning off the ignition key if you are just parking or waiting for somebody. It's always running for some reason. And uh, finally, uh, we don't have the most uh, efficient uh, uh, means of transportation in the world. And you don't have to go too far, just cross the Atlantic and you'll see a little bit better efficiency. Now, where are we? <clears throat> this is from the Yasa Institute in, uh, near Vienna. And we are about where the uh, vertical yellow line says where we have uh, some coal, some oil and natural gas, a little bit of nuclear, some hydro, a little bit of other, and the remaining residue of biomass. If you look in history, in 1850, the bulk of the energy we derived was from biomass. As we move forward, uh, we see the, the oil uh, shrinking over the next uh, 50 years or so. Uh, coal as well, natural gas expands, becomes the largest fossil fuel for a while, but then goes away gradually. Uh, and we see at the top of the diagram a gradual penetration of what we call modern biomass to distinguish from the old biomass on the left-hand side of the diagram. Now we heard this morning lots about biofuels and plants that can produce biofuels. I think from a policy point of view, it's important to have a, a grasp of the yields that these various possible, possible feedstocks uh, give us. On the left-hand side of the diagram, you see the ethanol uh, feedstocks. The top bar is sugar cane, followed by sugar beet, and then you have corn and wheat. These are materials from which ethanol is produced commercially today in Europe, in the United States, and in Brazil. Notice that uh, the units are in the uh, metric system, which one day will uh, be absorbed by the United States. Uh, it's cubic meters per hectare. And uh, you see sugarcane roughly gives you a six or so cubic meters per hectare. Some will say more, some will say less. But corn is a relative modest with uh, about half of it. But if you look at the oil uh, side of the diagram, 
everybody is a, is a dwarf except palm oil, a little bit the promise of Jatropha. And in terms of a, a policy uh, consequence, uh, that tells you the amount of area that needs to be dedicated to produce a significant amount of fuel. Now, this uh, made the press, believe it or not. Uh, on May the 1st of this year, the New York Times, in its editorial, talked about the ethanol promise and said what, is, what you can read on the screen, that uh, the driver, in this case, the, the rising oil prices at that time, has made people talk about substitutions. And uh, the main uh, reason for that is to become less vulnerable and less volatile on producers that are situated in uh, hot areas of the world, in many senses, and uh, would make uh, us Americans a little bit uh, less culpable regarding global warming. Now, this is the total picture of ethanol in the world uh, for the year 2005. Uh, there are lots of countries in this picture, but just focus your attention on Brazil and the United States, which make up the green and the yellow bar at the bottom of the diagram. And as it was already mentioned, the United States this year has surpassed Brazil in ethanol production for the first time. Uh, but other players are coming, and uh, the top of the bar is the European Union that has, as many have already mentioned, a mandate to have 5.75% of its uh, transportation fuels made up of biofuels. Uh, just a slight uh, correction, it is not by volume, it's by energy content. And it's not just uh, biodiesel in diesel, it's any biofuel in transportation fuels. So Europe is a large consumer and producer of biodiesels, therefore it will be the primary substitute, but ethanol has a role to play over there as well. But the point here is to show that, yes, uh, the two, three areas, Brazil, USA, and, and uh, European Union, are the dominant players, but there are a lot of uh, other players coming into the picture, such as uh, India, China, uh, Colombia, Canada, Thailand, uh, which means that uh, we're beginning to see a global picture out, out of uh, ethanol in, in the world. And I took the two uh, uh, larger com contributors to that bar, which are Brazil and the United States, and decided to very quickly review the policy history that they have gone through to implement their respective programs. Well, in Brazil, as all of you know, some with more precision than others regarding this business of, uh, of rainforest uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, in Brazil, it's all based on sugarcane, and it displaces today 40% of gasoline. 40%. And in addition to that, the country is today oil self-sufficient. It produces as much oil as it consumes. In fact, it exports oil because its oil is of uh, f first quality, so it imports, and its refineries are not equipped to process its own oil because it used to buy lousy oil from outside. And now it has to revamp the, the refineries to be able to use its own oil. In Brazil, contrary to here, the state of Sao Paulo is the driving force <coughs> in terms of supply and demand, at least initially. And up to 1975, there was a history of uh, 50 years of blending ethanol whenever it was convenient. The convenience meaning whenever the sugar price was down. But in 1975, there is a, a milestone, is, uh, is so-called uh, pro-alcohol program, which you will probably pronounce pro-alcohol, which is cool. It's a pro-alcohol that, that the guys in Brazil pronounce. Uh, it was launched uh, as a response, as a policy response to the sudden uh, price rise in oil deriving, derived from the 1973 oil crisis. Uh, it was continuation of something that was already happening for 50 years, but now uh, uh, institutionalized as a program. And the driver was, uh, was uh, security of supply and price. In the 1980s, uh, again, there is another crisis, Iran, Iraq, and so on and so forth. 
And neat ethanol is introduced. Neat ethanol is uh, pure ethanol, 96% ethanol, 4% water. It's the product comes from the distillation if you don't do something else to make it anhydrous. Uh, and in the introduction of neat ethanol required, of course, the introduction of vehicles that could handle that. These vehicles have a much higher compression ratio and have materials compatible with the fuel. Now, uh, a decade later, uh, oil prices moderate, ethanol in Brazil had some setbacks, ethanol was imported into Brazil even from the United States and from Europe and from everywhere else. Uh, during that decade, all incentives were removed because of the idea of uh, playing market forces as much as possible. But the mandate uh, remained. Uh, the definition of gasoline, the specification of gasoline in Brazil is that it's a fuel that contains ethanol and hydrocarbons. So that mandate is there. And the, uh, in the 2000s, the more last six years or so, ethanol is ever more competitive. A learning curve has taken its effect. Costs are lower, yields are higher, uh, production expands, exports begun to play a role. Uh, biodiesel makes a very meek entry into the marketplace, very, very small, tiny. And then there is the Brazilian FFVs, which contrary to uh, the American FFVs, can take anything, anytime, even water, because they are supplied with uh, hydrous ethanol and gasoline. And mind you, gasoline in, the, in, the, in Brazil has 25% ethanol anyway. And uh, the motorist, the driver, can select, can make his own cocktail or her own cocktail at the gas station. And that makes it a totally different approach from the American FFE in regards to the infrastructure of supply. And it, it has taken uh, a hold of the Brazilian public in a rage, and now 80% of the new cars are all FFEs. And there are problems associated with that, as we will see in a while. Brazil is promoting world trade of ethanol, and it was very much behind the New York border trade first international futures and options market inaugurated in 2004. Now, this is a snapshot of uh, the sugarcane industry in Brazil. From the top left of the diagram, you have the fields that are cultivated by 50,000 growers. Moving to the right, you have the ethanol making and sugar making, which are made in the same facility. They have 346 mills and distilleries today, and something like 50 under construction in various stages at this point. This goes to 160 distributors throughout the country. And then it goes to uh, either to markets or to exports. And this, this picture shows uh, two uh, nozzles filling up the same, uh, the same car. And that's exactly what happens. They don't do it at the same time. This was just for the picture. Uh, uh, basically, every gas station in Brazil, as you can see, the 32,000 gas stations in the country, the 90 plus percent, they sell both ethanol and the gasoline. Every gas station, we can say, has an ethanol pump right there. And that infrastructure was obtained in a single day when Brazil phased out premium gasoline. All the pumps were there, all the storage tanks were underneath. Uh, voila, overnight, just like Sweden, switched from the right to the left, and, and, and one day it got a few accidents, but uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, it worked. That's why I say that, as we'll see, perhaps uh, we are missing a point here. What are the national policy lessons that we get out of Brazil. Stakeholders are fundamental. We have heard hints of this from the last speaker before lunch. You cannot move it top down. You have to have agreement by the key stakeholders, which are the oil industry, the auto industry, and the ethanol and sugar makers. And government has a role to play, but mainly of a mediator. There must be cooperation between the supplier of the feedstock and the processor of the feedstock. And in Brazil, there is a social compact negotiated between the two without any involvement of government uh, that is based on an integrated gain along the productive chain. The fellow who produces the cane gains something 
from the sale of the ethanol or the sugar. It's not just for his sugar cane. And therefore, he can, he can, he's much more involved and integrated into this. There must be a national innovation system in place, otherwise it cannot move very far. And there was such a case in Brazil. Agricultural research is fundamental. Learning curve has, has shown that. It must also look at the resource, not just uh, something to produce ethanol or sugar. It must have what we have already heard this morning, a bio-refinery uh, uh, concept. A sugarcane uh, ethanol plant in Brazil today makes not only ethanol and sugar, it makes electricity. In fact, it's a surplus maker of electricity. It can provide the electricity to two, uh, towns of 100,000, 200,000 people on the surplus of that uh, factory. And it reduces waste also, uh, and it, it uses the, uh, the liquid uh, waste as a source of fertilization and irrigation. And of course, it helps to that the government is behind you. But the replication is, is not something like a template. Each country is different. Uh, there are other countries, as I already mentioned, in the world that are switching towards, uh, or not switch, are moving towards um, biofuels. Uh, China is one of them, but Colombia, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand are there. Regarding China, uh, people are very concerned when they mention China, some people here begin to shake. I think instead of shaking, you should dance because, or maybe move this shake into a dance <laughs> because, uh, because it, I think it's very useful that uh, we have lots of uh, countries uh, achieving development because that makes uh, for a more stable world and, and perhaps less conflicts. And regarding China, there was a recent uh, uh, initiative by the government to uh, by the year 2020 or 30 have a substantial uh, decrease in the demand for oil as a result of the improved efficiency of energy systems in that country plus a resort to alternative energies. Let's go back to or go back or come back to the United States where, oil, or where ethanol is based on corn and it has managed to displace 3% of gasoline as compared to 40% in the case of Brazil. And there is a target for, by the Department of Energy for 30% displacement calculated on the basis of 2004 consumption for the year 2030. Now in the United States, uh, the largest consumer of ethanol as such is California. Uh, my friends in California like to call them the 50th or 60th largest country in the world because of their sheer size and their independence in many respects. But they're huge, 35 million people, almost 35 million cars, and, and a tremendous economy. Uh, and they have these uh, environmental ideas that they start there and somehow propagate to the rest of the country and then to the rest of the world. And they had this uh, switch from uh, MTBE to ethanol, and that created a, an instant demand that, that brings uh, like a billion gallons of ethanol to California every year. But even if they didn't, they didn't switch, they would have used ethanol for other reasons like octane uh, enhancement. The supply is in the Midwest, the demand is in California and, and, and growingly in the East as well. In 1980, uh, gasohol, uh, you may remember that uh, terminology, the 10% blend was sort of uh, uh, attempted to catch on, but didn't really catch. Uh, lots of distilleries uh, in the United States went bust. Uh, on the other hand, uh, parallel to that, some imports were allowed. And uh, I heard once uh, the chief of ADM ethanol saying it was good. The United States imported ethanol at that stage because it gave credibility to the ethanol in the eyes of the oil industry in this country because it was large in size. I asked him, how about today? Well, today is a different story. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the uh, gasohol was the sort of a faltering start. Uh, there were 
imports, and then when they saw too many imports, they introduced import barriers. The 54 cents on the gallon is actually not, it's an additional tariff. There is a 2.5% ad valorem uh, tax also due. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a moderation oil prices. The legislation and practice of reformulated gasoline came into place, creating a demand for oxygen and then bringing in the MTBE, which is the preferred uh, oxygen, uh, oxygenator of uh, gasoline uh, f from the point of view of the oil industry. But then there was this thing of the winter gasoline, where ethanol could be used without much of a problem and would uh, cut down the carbon monoxide emissions uh, easily. And uh, the other driver was also, and has been also uh, all along, the uh, stretching of gasoline. So you displace gasoline with ethanol, you, you uh, sort of prolong the life of the, uh, of the hydrocarbon. Octane, of course, always an important uh, uh, contribution by ethanol. Ethanol has 110 octane number compared to the gasoline you buy in the various stations that is in the, in the region of the 90s. So if you add ethanol to gasoline, it kicks up the uh, octane rating. Now, uh, we have novelties in the 2000s uh, with MTB ban on, on uh, uh, allegations of uh, contamination of water tables. Uh, ethanol production expanded considerably as a result of that and as a result more recently of the energy bill. Uh, which brought in uh, mandates that a mandate for a renewable fuel standard that stimulated both ethanol and biofuels and biodiesel, I should say. And then the, the, the FFVs in the United States. I think uh, among us here, I think it's a little bit silly, this E85 thing, because you have a flexible fuel car and an inflexible infrastructure. So, what is the point of having? a flexible fuel vehicle that has no flexibility in the infrastructure. That's why I, I raised a, a point saying, well, if you have three or four brands of gasoline in every gas station, why don't you retire one of those pumps and buy straight from the distillery? It's called E95 because every alcohol leaves the distillery in the United States has 5% uh, gasoline. Because it, it will immediately create an infrastructure for those uh, cars. It probably will soak, out all, soak up all the uh, ethanol availability, but at, at least you get this thing rolling. Because you're not driving any benefit from, from the E85 program because the vehicles are not optimized for using gasoline. They are wasting gasoline. So you have E85 with the aim of saving, and in the end you're wasting, you see? Uh, that's why you have to think and act outside the box. But anyway, there are lots of interests behind the 85. Uh, some of the in, the in the auto industry would say, well, you know, United States, some of the of our, uh, you know, regions are cold in the winter, so we need a, something to start up in the cold. Yeah, sure, not a problem. Just have a little gasoline tank inside the HUD, underneath the HUD, <laughs> and that's it. Instead of going to the gas station just to fill up with the ethanol, whatever you want to fill up, you put a little gasoline on that. So in the first thing in the morning, you turn it, and then it will, the thing will go forever. It's a little inconvenience, but on the other hand, I mean, it makes it uh, viable. And in the United States, the Chicago exchanges have uh, begun future contracts with corn ethanol without much success. You've seen this already. The Midwest is where the production is. Very few uh, production plants on the extremes of the country. However, the consumption is on the the two coasts and, and uh, the area here that we are and, and Florida. Now, fuel ethanol in the United States is growing very fast. Uh, the, the line uh, to the left uh, means the actual production and the energy bill requirements come on the right. As you can see, the actual production is already surpassing the energy bill requirement. Uh, we, lots of people talk this morning and, and some are concerned about the issue of cellulosic uh, as uh, a longer term as, uh, alternative to using food crops. And <clears throat> there, are, there are obvious limits to starch or sugar-based biofuels. For one thing, they are also suppliers of food. For the other, other side is that there is a limit in the area that you can dedicate to these uh, feedstocks. 
The DOE, I think, has already mentioned this this morning, that they have uh, programs going on. But uh, some of them uh, believe that they are, they are talking the talking, but not walking the walk. In other words, there is no funding, the, or the funding is not adequate, put it this way. Obviously, uh, cellulosic technologies address lots of the issues that we are discussing here, beginning with national security, because it's something that you generate 2 billion tons of uh, arg wastes every year, and like uh, 200, 300 million tons of uh, urban wastes. So there's plenty of uh, feedstocks. It would uh, uh, contribute, uh, signing or not signing Kyoto, you would making a contribution on the climate change. And uh, you would uh, provide jobs in the, in the rural areas. Also, we'll cut import, and as I already repeated myself. Now, this is interesting because it shows for the different areas of the world, which are the areas that are surplus oil or sub, and or surplus grain and sugar. So if you look at, uh, look at this diagram, you have uh, a two... Uh, one extreme situation, which is Asia Pacific, which is deficit in oil and in grain and sugar. If you look at uh, the uh, Western Hemisphere, less North America, they are on the positive side. Uh, and then you have the intermediate cases. Uh, North America has not enough oil, but has plenty of food. Uh, the European Union, likewise. And Africa is the reverse. They have lots of uh, oil and not so much food. That uh, sort of a, is an indication of the, of the tension that there is in, in these countries if you dedicate uh, food to, uh, to, uh, to fuel. And it's important because in the case of Africa, which is an area of the world that has probably the largest potential for biofuels, over a period of time, uh, they are uh, food uh, deficient. Here I, I try to uh, sort of a sketch what are the barriers and drivers for, to biofuels in terms of policy formulation. It has to do with uh, the perception of risk, uh, the availability of capital, uh, approach to marketing, infrastructure, uh, public policies that support innovation, the environment, the idea of sustain sustainable supplies that operate on a well-functioning market, and the understanding that there are definite limits to uh, the fact that biofuels can meet uh, transport fuels demand. In other words, one should not expect biofuels to take over hydrocarbon. It will never happen. We can, it, it has a role but it's limited. One has to recognize that this role is limited and the policies should incorporate that. And in addition to that, what is happening is people are demanding change uh, and they are also concerned about delinking the biofuels from the food uh, markets. Uh, and then there are uh, policy decisions already in place in the European Union, the, the, the directives that were mentioned in the United States, and I, I mentioned China in some detail and all of these other countries. Japan is, is a country that may uh, gradually uh, become a large consumer of biofuels and they will produce none of them. So they are potential uh, buyers from various sources in the world, including from China. But what is interesting is that the guys who have uh, uh, you know, who are in, in the business of uh, investing uh, savings from other people, such as Goldman Sachs, uh, they are taking a long-term uh, view of these things and are putting their dollars in long-term perspectives, such as a uh, uh, $30 million investment in Iogen, uh, a cellulosics-based uh, ethanol company mm -hmm. in Canada. Uh, Talking about sustainability, is, is, is biofuels to be some kind of a curiosity that will have a sort of a blimp in a curve and go away? I think, uh, I think we, we need to think about biofuels in a, 
in a different way than, than we have been thinking so far, particularly in the United States. Uh, as I already said, we waste energy. We never turn off the car, so on and so forth. So we always talk about the supply side of things. And I fear that as we increase the supply of biofuels in the United States, if we do not change our mindset, we will be moving from a situation of wasting fossil fuels to a situation of wasting biofuels. That is a, a crucial thing, because if you continue with the same mindset, there's no area that will ever satisfy the growing wasteful demands that we have in our society. But anyway, in terms of sustainability, this is a crucial uh, consideration. And I should say that any country in the world, and I mentioned a few that are already engaged in this, uh, that gathers the minimum resources, area, people, money, they should promote uh, domestic biofuels with the understanding that it's limited, that it should be well used, and so on and so forth. But they also should play the international market. Why is it that uh, uh, there is no reluctance in buying natural gas, in buying oil in the international trade, and there is a reluctance of buying biofuels? I think the gentleman from Dreyfus already alluded to that. I think uh, one, you know, you see Dreyfus, they are investing in the United States, in, in distilleries here, they are investing in Brazil. They will invest anywhere where it makes sense. Same way that uh, uh, we have no hesitation in buying natural gas from Canada or electricity from Mexico or oil from all kinds of sources. Why do hesitate trading internationally? Because there is no Saudi Arabia of ethanol. It is spreading out, as I mentioned before. And therefore, one cannot compare, let's say, Brazil with the unstable areas of the Middle East. And one thing that is not very much mentioned is the issue of uh, carbon recycling that uh, m may add value to, to biofuel. We need to move from this situation where uh, biofuels are a curiosity into a situation where they become a commodity, a, a sustainable fuel. And uh, let me see. And the next, uh, in, in this context, uh, I think, you know, the, the, our country is a country of ingenuity. It's a country of innovation. It's a country of resilience. It's a country that, that uh, has a tremendous uh, capacity to do things. It's a country that once have once having a, a mind set on something, uh, it, this has, gets to be done. So I think, and we have wonderful uh, universities beginning here at Rice. We have lots of young people who are very well educated, intelligent, creative, and so on and so forth. I think uh, these people should be encouraged to uh, spend time and and, and contribute to the, the broad area. And, and I'm going to give you an example of uh, what innovation can do in a, in a small scale, but important. If you take 10% ethanol blend in gasoline, it displaces more or less 10%. Some will argue with me, and, and I'll accept the argument. If you look at the FFEs, the E85s, or even the Brazilian FFEs, if they are off the optimum setting, they'll be wasting. You think you're solving a problem and you're not, you're aggravating the problem. Uh, hybrid performance is, is being lauded, but depending on where they operate, how they operate, and so on and so forth, their contribution may be questionable. If you take, let's say, a, a typical biodiesel uh, blend in diesel, it's, it's the, in, the, in Europe, uh, the legal limit is 5% by volume. In the United States, I don't know what the legal limit is, but typical is 5%. 
if you bring in 5% of biodiesel into a diesel blend, it more or less replaces 5% diesel. Okay? So these are sort of a broad numbers for you to think. The company I'm associated with, uh, International Fuel, has developed on the basis of ingenuity, creativity, etc., a, a vegetable oil based material that has a trade name of diesel lift. I'm giving this a, as an example. If you use 0.17% of this, like one part in 600 of diesel, it saves 5% diesel. In other words, it, ter it is 30 times more efficient than biodiesel. And it is a biodiesel in itself. It's a different, it's a more sophisticated um, biodiesel. But here you have uh, an American-made product that is out there, and it doesn't require any government mandate, uh, doesn't require new plantations of any kind, is already doing you know, a limited job, but it is doing a job. It saves not only the fossil fuel that it, that it saves, but it saves the use of biodiesel. And if you're going to be using biodiesel on 5%, you don't need to. You can use the biodiesel for other things. Like the diesel you save, you can also use for other things. And, and I, I see, for instance, that, that this particular technology is biodiesel based and it contributes to energy security in, in a modest way, but uh, it's ready to use. So examples of this nature can spring out, spring up of uh, lots of uh, universities and, and companies in this country. I'm finishing. So we talked about the mindset and the mindset shift. And I think as we mo modify our, our mindset, it doesn't depend on, that, on us. Uh, our mindset affects policy and policy affects our mindsets. We, generally speaking, we have a good life compared to the rest of the world. But we have a wasteful life too. And since we live in the same planet, uh, maybe there are limits to to this. And I think the wisdom lies in, uh, in rethinking the way we are, the way we act, and what is our mindset, and maybe shifting it, in which situation you will see biofuels not as the dominant fuel, but playing a role in a diverse fuel mix. That will improve security. It's very difficult to imagine how we can organize the way we live, but it's something to think about. It is important, we are already using information technology all over the place. Uh, and that has a lot to do with, with transportation needs. It doesn't replace them entirely, but it can make a contribution. And I, I would, you know, if you, I'm sure 99% of you have, has gone to Europe at least once, if not 10 times or more. You see the role of rail in Europe. It, it's true that they are much more dense, compact, etc., and we are much more spread out and so on and so forth. But I think um, there must be clever ways of uh, using more rail than, than we use and improving the convenience of public transportation and sometimes even turn the ignition off. That if, if you think about the amount of gallons that is wasted while the 200 and some million people who are driving cars are not turning the ignition off, it will make a difference. You're probably familiar with something called cafe, which is not the good coffee we have from time to time, but the corporate average fuel efficiency which is an average mileage that the automobile companies have to produce in the combination of their total output. That's what uh, Susan Shishki mentioned this morning, the 28 miles per gallon and the 20.2 miles per gallon on the SUVs. I think we need to, uh, working with the, with the auto industry, increase the CAFE, and not only that, uh, including the CAFE, which so far is excluded, the SUVs, uh, because they, they make quite a difference in terms of consumption. And last word is that innovation is key. 
And if there is one thing this society is capable is innovation. And I think we should uh, always uh, think about that and act on it. Thank you very much. Questions before we move on. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Well, if there are no no questions, uh, we'll go ahead and move along. Um, I don't see is Guyton Darnell here. There you are. Uh, Guyton's going to come down and talk to us a little bit about um, the biodiesel initiative here at Rice. Um, and I have uh, a little bit of pride in introducing him because he was a student of mine actually here. Uh, some time ago. So, thank you. Button I hit to advance. It's just this button right here. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about what we've been doing at Rice in terms of biodiesel and what we're going to be hopefully doing later on. Um, let me see. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> Try that again. There. Okay. Sorry. Perfect. Either either here or here. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss is what exactly is biodiesel. Most people have talked about that. Why we want to have biodiesel, what we're doing at Rice, and then what we want to do in the future. So what exactly is biodiesel? Uh, here's all of what the actual scientific definition is. It's an ester, which means it's a carbon-hydrogen chain with an oxygen in the middle. Looks kind of like that. And it's regulated by a bunch of bodies in, uh, in the U.S. Now, it really looks very different depending on what feedstock you use. We heard a little bit of discussion this morning about this. Now, this is uh, two different types of biodiesel that I made. On the top is used oil, which has come from the uh, serveries at Rice. The other one is something that I happened to go buy at Kroger. Um, as you can see in the second slit, you've got the, what biodiesel looks like. The top is a little darker. And you've got that nice, clean look. And then your, uh, your glycerol, or what's known as soap crude for some people in the industry, it's much darker when you're using a waste vegetable oil. So as you can see, it depends on what you're using. That characteristic will carry over into uh, both the soap crude and the biodiesel that's produced. The process, as was mentioned, is called transesterification. And the idea is that for every 100 pounds of vegetable oil that you uh, start with, you add about 10 pounds of an alcohol. This is normally methanol and a catalyst, sodium hydroxide, or lye, and you get about 100 pounds of biodiesel and 10 pounds of this glycerol. So why do we want biodiesel? Well, as you know, we need new, clean domestic production with stuff that doesn't have as big of a price swing. Um, as we mentioned, the US doesn't really produce produce that much oil in comparison to how much we use. So it's much very important to try and find sources that, so we can start having other things in the US. While prices have now plummeted in relative senses to $60 a barrel, this is still very expensive. And more importantly, it fluctuates a lot. Which for, for people in industry who require the use of diesel fuel and other fuels, is very, very uh, hard on them because it's speculative. They don't know what's going to happen. So we need something that, you know, you have a, you're growing a, something, the price won't fluctuate quite as much. The other issue is, you ever been behind one of these boats, this big smoker? Not only do you have to deal with the uh, particulate matter and the carbon monoxide, it also produces a lot of carbon dioxide, dealing with global warming, as everyone has been discussing already today. So exactly what have we been doing at Rice? We decided that, well, we've got a bunch of oil that's just kind of sitting there, somewhere around between one to 3,000 gallons a year. And our campus bus shuttles use somewhere between eight and 10,000 gallons of, of, of diesel. So if we were able to produce biodiesel, we have a ready market that we can consume everything that we make. So we decided about a year ago to form uh, ULA uh, Ruby, which is Rice University Biodiesel Initiative. It was started by a number of undergraduates, which included uh, Lizzie Clark and uh, several graduate students, uh, mainly Matt Yarrison and Christine Robichaud. Um, Matt Yarrison was one of the driving spearhead of, uh, of this project and pretty much showed us all what to do. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, taken with all the advisors and other associated members at the end of uh, this last year. 
So for the past year, we started small and tried to work up. We started in the 200 milliliter process, then we went to the one liter, then the one gallon, and then we built this big 70 gallon reactor. And uh, the idea being that you learn from your problems in the small, and that way when you go to the larger processes, you don't have quite as many problems. Now this is the pilot uh, plant that we have built and constructed and that actually currently resides in one of the colleges. So if for some odd reason you hear an explosion and somebody says a building is blown up at rice, I know nothing about it. It wasn't me. <laughs> so what we do is we take our oil, we filter it, and then we, we pass it through this 70 gallon reactor uh, where we add the alcohol mixed with uh, the lye, process it, and after about two hours, say around uh, 40 to 60 degrees centigrade, which is about 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we wash it with a little water, it comes out nice and clean. <coughs> At least that's the hope for process. We actually haven't been able to do one giant batch yet in the 70 gallon reactor. Hopefully we'll be doing that in the next few weeks. So what next? Besides, of course, figuring out what else we're supposed to do with uh, our main reactor. Well, as people have mentioned, we've got all this glycerol. Um, for every 100 pounds of biodiesel, you get 10 pounds, which is more or less one pound per gallon of biodiesel. Now, originally, this was very helpful to people making biodiesels. It helped drive the price down. Now it's driving the price up. The biodiesel industry is rapidly expanding. We've heard 300 million gallons. That means 300 million pounds of glycerol will be produced a year. Now, uh, I'd tell you everything I could about the fermentation process, but um, Dr. Gonzalez is my advisor, and I don't really want to get in trouble with him, so I'm going to let him talk about this tomorrow. But uh, we'll just say that you can ferment the glycerol, and they're making lots of products, and it, it's starting to look very interesting, and we're hoping to have a solution in the next few months to a year. Now, we've discussed soybeans, and what, what can soy do? We, uh, we consume 30 billion gallons of diesel fuel a year. If we were to take all of the agricultural land currently used in the U.S., and that includes Texas, California, Oregon, and uh, most of Idaho, that gives our full agriculture production. If you notice, there's a slightly different green up there, which is Oregon and half of Idaho. That's what current soybean production is. But if we were to produce all of that, so that would mean that Rice University would be covered in soybeans. We would still only get 23 billion gallons of biodiesel a year. So that clearly isn't the answer. Um, that's why we'll look into possible other things. Um, and we realize it's not the cure-all. It's not the magic bullet. However, there are other things that we can do. And that's when we come to waste grease, what we're dealing with at rice. Now, there are about 300 million gallons of waste grease produced a year. So that means that everything else just ends up into your food, which is one of the reasons why everyone gets the freshman 15 at rice. Um, but if we were able to deal with all that 300 uh, million gallons, we could have possibly a $1 billion industry a year. The economics are much better than soybean oil. You see this uh, pie chart shows what the, the price it costs out for soybeans. If you're able to use waste vegetable oil instead, your feedstock price drops from, say, 17 cents a pound, it's actually a little more than that, to about 8 or 9 cents a pound. So all of a sudden, it's much cheaper, you put a little bit more money in on the capital side, and it, it makes much more sense economically. Now this leads to the fact that all of a sudden we could have these reactors at more or less everywhere. You're going to have small little pilot projects right in the city, right in a little building, in a closet, anywhere that's relatively safe. The technology is very simple. I mean, I've been able to do it, and let me tell you, I don't know that much about chemical engineering, though Dr. Zigarakis is trying to fix that problem. <laughs> but even this reactor, if it was running full bore, we could produce 100,000 gallons a year. Now, if we made that a little bigger, then, you know, 200,000, 400,000, get the idea. So here's a possibility of having these little reactors in a fairly small amount of space, being able to produce enough biodiesel to run a facility. And now all of a sudden, it makes much more sense. Now we have distributed uh, power. I mean, you can just take that biodiesel you produce and you can put it in your generator. You can do everything else like that. 
And uh, it makes much more sense because you don't have to use the giant uh, refineries that we now have to do. They can be used for something else. So that's uh, more or less my talk. I've tried to make it quick and painless for all of you. Uh, here are our sponsors. Uh, the Shell Center for Sustainability has been wonderful for us. has given us a considerable amount of money. However, the CSES and Leadership Rice have also donated money and both of the departments that happen to be sponsoring this talk, uh, which would be uh, Chubby and Civi, have given us money and time. Um, this has been especially true in the chemical engineering department. Not only have Dr. <coughs> Gonzalez and Dr. Zigarakis given us time, uh, Mr. Dick Cronister has spent a ton of time helping to build our reactor. I also don't want to forget to mention Dr. Alvarez and uh, Bob Dawson, both in CIVI, who have helped advise us, and Bob Dawson has done, dealt with a lot of the administrative issues. So uh, that's my talk. If anyone has any questions. Quite uh, attracted by your idea of distributed production. Given what we've heard earlier about the uh, quality control um, issues associated with biodiesel, how would you envision that being handled in a distributed model? Um, admittedly, you do have to buy some equipment that's relatively expensive, and we are currently in the process of doing that. Um, the equipment itself isn't that large, it's relatively expensive, but in comparison to what, how much you'll be producing, it's no problem. So then you can go ahead and do all of those tests. There are, as well, there are a number of quick and dirty tests to at least check to make sure you're okay. Um, but you, know, you still would need to go through the ASTM specifications, which involves using a centrifuge, using a gas chromatograph. However, using those things and checking each batch that you do does not take a huge amount of time. So you can take and check your say your 200 gallon batch, you take a little sample, you test it, that's not going to take more than 20 or 30 minutes. And then that way you know, okay, is this stuff ready to go? Can we sell it? And the answer is yes, then you go ahead and do it. Um, yes, quality control is extremely important in this industry. We found that exceptionally true here at Rice because if we make a mistake, um, you don't know me. So uh, yes, that is something that has to be dealt with, but it can be done efficiently and fairly inexpensively. Let me just add to that, if you think about distributed energy, you're talking about a closed loop system, say we're manufacturing our waste freeze to run in the shuttle bus, and so we're going to have our own system, because obviously we have the incentive to not wreck the engine in the shuttle buses, right? So when the previous speakers talked about the problem of quality control, you know, that's your telling me I'm going to put a centralized plant somewhere, and that if that person's not regulated the way, say, the refining industry has learned through processes and standards and specifications. If we have no specifications for biodiesel, that's a problem. But in an internal system, you think about an internal system like our university or an apartment complex that has uh, public eating facilities, or we had an idea here at Rice, which we hope Shell will help us with, which is to maybe then teach HISD how to have their own closed loop system. Right In these smaller systems where you have the control of the internal uh, auditing and, and technical facilities uh, practices, it seems to me in a closed loop system, the whole question of specifications and regulations for specifications is less severe than it would be in an open system where you're just going to sell on the open market. I, I have a brief question. What do you do with the bad batches when something goes wrong? There are several different things to be dealt uh, to, to be done with them. Um, easiest way for me at the moment, if I'm since I've been making mostly the small batches, is I go over to help with safety and say thanks. Um, however, the the good thing is is most of the stuff you're dealing with isn't that dangerous. So you typically are able to reprocess it. Um, you know, possibly adding more catalyst and you know trying to fix the batch. Or there are other things, I mean, one of the good things is, uh, like the glycerol could be composted if worse came to worse. And a lot of the things that you're making, it can be used in other, it has, it have other uses. I mean, I know a lot of people, I mean, th this is an industry for the past, uh, only in the past five years has it become really interesting in the US. Before that, everyone was making it in their garages. So they were typically taking their glycerol or anything they kind of made that, was, that wasn't quite biodiesel, and they'd turn it into soap. 
And that's one of the reasons why it's known as soap crude is you take that stuff and boom, you've, you've got another, another product. Um, admittedly, you do have problems and you, I mean, that's the problem with making a big batch. I know of a, another uh, biodiesel producer that just made 2,500 gallons of soap, of, of emulsion. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, what do we want to do to fix that problem? Um, and uh, there are ways around it. Once you figure that out, you can solve this. Couldn't you use it as a heating oil? Um, are you like as opposed to using it as a like as, as right. diesel you know, as opposed that, to heating? That, that, oil? that you know it doesn't comply with your specification. You can still burn it. Yes, it depends what you're burning it in, though. Um, and I mean, part of the reason is is when you make biodiesel. Uh, I kind of touched on it. You wash your biodiesel. And the reason for washing biodiesel, one is to get out any uh, excess methanol because that way it can it's stored and so it's not as flammable. And secondly, if you have any catalyst inside of it, uh, that lye will chew through your engine. Sure. And so if you have something, if you haven't washed it, that lye is still going to be in there and that's going to be cycling in your engine. So my second question is, do you recover your methanol? We personally are trying to. Um, we've built a little five-gallon distillation can that um, certain people aren't too happy with at the moment. But uh, it is, it's is—it's very possible to do, um, and we intend to do it. Um, but if you don't, how do you dispose of the methanol? When you, so, there's, so you have two products. You have one, you have your, your glycerol. Mm -hmm. Two, you have your biodiesel. If you just wash the biodiesel, the water will take the, the methanol out of the biodiesel. Right. And then what? And then it typically will either be in that water or it'll uh, vaporize. Right. And, sorry. No, but if you have it in the water, methanol is a chemical poison. You yes. can't just dump it in the sink. Correct. So what do you do? At the moment, we haven't had to worry with that because oh. we've been just doing it on such a small scale that, again, we can figure out something else to do with it. But um, I, to be honest, larger scale, I haven't looked into it at the moment. I was just going to follow up on that. Uh, Amy is already alluding to see what now, uh, the essence of my question when she mentioned Shell. The, right now, this is a very brilliant uh, uh, academic uh, uh, program, exercise, whatever. But uh, going forward, do you anticipate, do you envision some sort of partnership with industry uh, to maybe develop into a larger scale? That is. I mean, personally, I am very interested in that. As the program itself, possibly, I, in all honesty, I can't, I can't answer the question because I, you know, I'm, I'm just the graduate student who's, who's well, running it. Just talking about yeah. but, <laughs> Trying not to answer the question for him. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a great education, educational exercise for the students because all the question, questions you ask are basically what we're trying to teach, to teach them. Uh, we're dealing with a very, very tough feed, feed, feed stock is uh, widely variable. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll use one oil, sometimes they'll, they'll use another one, sometimes they'll cook French, French fries. Next time they're going to fry shrimp, so who knows what uh, you have in there. So they have basically to learn how to avoid the bad, the bad batch, but the key issue here is uh, the free fatty acids. They have to learn to do titration to identify basically what they have to, to do. Uh, do it in two, in, two, in two steps. First, esterification with uh, sulfuric acid and then with the uh, methanol and issues and issues like this they have really tried to basically take the right approach the methanol recovery, recovery is something 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 that we will definitely do before the large production actually actually starts uh, so it's a good educa educational uh, tool at this at this point because they are basically learn, learn, learning unit operation, operations that uh, you know, a big industry will have to do. Now, whether this is a huge potential market, market well, I don't really know. There are, there are about 100 million gallons of fried uh, waste cooking oil avail available in the United States, estimated, estimated. That's not a huge market. 
and the is and the issues actually are significant. Not everybody can you know really understand the process well enough to test the feed the feedstock, and not everybody has 30,000 GC and the centrifuges and the Penske mountains and so and and so forth that one needs to make sure that what you finally get is a fuel grade oil. I guess I would just just for discussion, I think all the things that we just heard in, in your presentation too in the discussion argues against the, the viability of going too small. Because you need the extra tanks for storage of bad batches. You need to be able to recover your alcohol and, and deal with wastewater and environmental safety and health and all these sorts of things. You don't want somebody trying to, you know, fit that into their closet. Uh, Admittedly, I mean, closet was a, a bit of a, a little, little bit of an exaggeration. Sure. But there is a lot of interest in, in how small can we go. And I think, you know, that decentralized energy is a good thing. You just have to, is it, is it in the systems of approach, yes. is it really a good thing? I mean, if the person's more exposed and the environment is more exposed, it's okay. On to, to go with that, I mean, one of, the, one of the other things, I mean, I was trying to make my talk as short as possible, but one of the other things we're looking into is, can we use ethanol instead of methanol? And then all of a sudden it's a little safer. I mean, if you're just using methanol, as you mentioned, it's, it's very dangerous. And you don't really want somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing you know, <coughs> dealing with 40 or 50 gallons at a time because, you know, the, the implications of once they get around to suing you are huge. So it, it is very important to make sure that if somebody is running that, that small reactor, they understand the, the concepts, and so that is important. Well, and that also gets at another issue that I mentioned since you're here at an institution of higher learning. To do any kind of distributed energy system, really, is going to require a much more educated population in terms of the choices we make and the science behind it. And so we're seeing this trend, I think, in universities in America, definitely here at Rice, but also on other campuses that some of you are either here representing or your oil company people and you're supporting, which is how do we raise the level of understanding of the average person? about these systems, right? So of course, you're going to have to have professional facilities people and equipment and so forth if you're going to do it in a closed system. But the question is, to even have an organization, you know, say a corporation or some group like that make the decision what to do, it takes a skill set that's actually cross-disciplinary, right? You're going to have to have people trained to analyze the issues across a broad range of subjects. I can't just take this subject or that subject. I'm going to have to take a couple of different areas in science and have some basic knowledge. And so I think that really gets at the whole question of if you're studying energy <coughs> on an academic level, right? What different disciplines do you actually have to study today versus 20 years ago, right? It's a much broader range of subjects we have to study today in terms of our climate class and, and uh, understanding material science and understanding uh, environmental issues in addition to the traditional chemical engineering and petroleum engineering and so forth. Okay, I think we're ready for uh, our next session. Um, I, I think what we're going to, what we'll do is uh, let's have uh, Adam Schubert, who's our next speaker, uh, is going to talk about um, corporate perspective. Uh, he is the U U.S. Product Strategy Manager for BP Fuels Management Group. Um, and I think let's have Adam talk and then we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and do the rest of the session. Okay. Th thank you, Amy. Uh, th thanks to the Baker Institute for inviting me here today to uh, speak on getting serious about biofuels. So I I get to move from being the first speaker after lunch to be the last speaker before break. I'm not sure whether I'm better or worse off because of that transition. But BP takes biofuels very seriously, and we'll talk more about that. And for reasons that many of our speakers today have gone through, and this has been a tremendous experience for me to 
with all the diverse viewpoints represented in this room to really do a lot of the introductory material and help build a lot of the case that I hope to make today. So, what are serious biofuels? We talk, most of our discussion today is around policy objectives. Diversity of supply, em emissions, where the supply comes from. Those are the, that's the language we usually talk about in debates about energy and debates about fuel. But there's a lot more to that in making it a business that isn't, that isn't, the, that isn't the cottage industry, that isn't the crazy guys in the Midwest. It's about being a significant, sustainable, and increasing part of the fuel supply in the U.S., in Europe, in all, in all of the world. It's about economic viability, making sure that there's, there's rent to be shared by everybody in the value chain, as one of the other earlier speakers said, so that everybody can, ma can make a go of this, and that incentives aren't the only driver in here. The fuels have to be functional and reliable. We have to deliver them day to day. The businesses that are running that depend on reliable supplies of fuel, motorists who depend on their vehicles running when they, when they use them for various things that we all depend on our vehicles to do. It means consistency of quality, cons formulations that meet the needs of those vehicles. And, and then lastly, and most importantly, it's got to meet the needs of the consumer. It has to get, make their vehicles have to run. Most, most consumers I speak to don't particularly relish the uh, visit to the gas station, even if they're BP stations. I haven't quite figured that one out, but uh, vehicle range is important. Vehicle fuel cost is important. I'd, I'd venture more people in this room know what they paid for their last gallon of gasoline than their last gallon of milk. Cost is very important. We need to, all of the, all of these factors need to come together for a serious fuel, a fuel that's, we think needs to become, needs and will become on the order of 30% of our fuel supply over the next couple decades, 30%. Deficiencies of a few percent cause prices to spike erratically and, and, re, and cause uh, public investigations. We're looking at biofuels to be 30 percent of our fuel supply. This is serious. The industry needs to work in a way that makes those fuels with the same reliability, the same attention to quality as goes into our current fuels. Something that we can do, something that we will do, something that we must do. So, drivers for change. Th three key issues for sustainable mobility. We can't keep, we're going to biofuels because we don't have a choice. We, can, we can't, getting to sustainable future requires changes in behavior on the motorist, requires changes in the vehicles for more efficiency, requires changes in the fuels that we use. BP, we fo we'll, fo we'll be focusing on the fuels because that's our, that's our business, but we're just a part of the answer, but we're going to do our best to make that part come true, make it reliable, make it serious. Greenhouse gas reductions, similar to things we've discussed earlier today, tr do business as usual, transport energy demand doubles by 2050 doubles. We're worried about supply today. We're worried about peak oil. Business as usual isn't feasible. We all know that. We need to, we need to chew on efficiency. We need to chew on consumer behavior. We need to, we need to chew on renewable <coughs> sources of supply. Transport is 21 percent of CO2 emissions. In, in a world where we already emit too much and we need to make very serious reductions. Biofuels is, isn't the silver bullet, but it's one of the wedges there. It's a big wedge, we can make, and we need to make that happen. So, 
what does the fuels value chain look at when we look at this as a business and, and not just as a policy? Value chain goes from production through conversion. We need to move the, we need to move the biofuel to the terminal for distribution, truck it around to gas stations or fuel stations, whatever you like to call them if they're it's not gasoline. Uh, we need to we need equipment at the retail site to put another fuel on their four quarts. And then the end user. Had, Somehow that classic car came in there. And, you know, the generic cars just never seem to look right. Uh, mm -hmm. Policy space talks about feedstocks, getting sustainable feedstocks, both in quant that we can get renewably, without undesired side effects on biodiversity, on other, on unintended consequences, and it on CO2 emissions, on many other, many other speak, issues are a huge piece of the policy space. Emissions of, of the vehicle are in the policy space. What isn't in there is the rest of the value chain in between. That's, where the, that's the business space. We talk, we talk in many circles about Ethanol is being almost synonymous with biofuels. Biofuels equals ethanol. Ethanol equals biofuels. BP, we say that's not necessarily true. Let's think about it. We're, we're on the verge, in order to get to the biofuel penetration that we need in the future, of having to make tremendous changes in the, in the plant technology that we use to produce those fuels, going from the ethanol fermentation, the biodiesel transesterification, things that we've done for a long time, things that are fairly simple, to much more sophisticated plants needed for lignocellulosic feedstocks or for biomass to liquids or other more, more advanced technologies yet to be realized. If we're going to make that big change in the process infrastructure, is there any particular reason we need to stay with the same molecule or can we look for other molecules that might give better vehicle performance and make it more productive for the consumer, make the economics work better? Business success in biofuels requires attention to the full value chain. We're not sure that we necessarily know what the right molecule is. I know we don't know what the right molecule is. But I suspect it's more than one. It's going to change over time. We need to make sure that when we're formulating policies and processes that we consider that we live in a moving world and leave that and that let's not lock in on a single target that's really irrelevant to the goals. The goals are sustainable feedstocks, the goals are air quality, the goals aren't producing a particular fuel. So what fuels are we doing today? We're, we're making turn starch and sugar crops into ethanol. We all know about that. We make oil crops into biodiesel. We know about that. Keep emphasizing, as some the earlier speakers have, ethanol is a single molecule. Ethanol is ethanol, no matter what we make it from. We can make it cheaper or more expensive. We can enhance our supply of feedstocks for making it in greater volume but it's ethanol. Biodiesel is a lot more complex because different feedstocks give us different molecules, different molecules that have different properties and cold flow and storage stability, other things that, are, that matter to consumers. Consumers expect consistent quality in their fuel, particularly in the diesel space where consumers are commercial users, commercial users who who operate on thin margins and fuel costs is a big chunk of their of their operating budget who look at fuel and cost out to multiple decimal places consistency of quality is keen and addressing consistent quality with variable feedstocks is a challenge we haven't quite figured out yet many other many things going on here Many things we're trying to do with biofuels, achieve the greenhouse gas reductions modestly with the fuels we have today, 
more importantly, as we move to more advantaged processes, making more, making different molecules, we can increase that benefit. We have the, clearly the benefit to the rural economy of in increasing demand for agricultural products until we hit the until we hit the food versus fuel debate, in which case we need to think hard about how we manage our source of feed stocks. Ethanol and biodiesel are not the ideal fuel molecules because there's limits on how much we can put in fuel. And we need to consider the cars that we have on the road. In the U.S. today, we have about 230 million vehicles on the road. We sell about 17 million new vehicles every year. It means the cars we have on the road turn over very slowly. And we need to keep supplying fuel to all of those cars for, for the lifetime that people expect to get out of them. Ethanol creates other intended, unintended consequences due to its high vapor pressure when blended in low-level blends. And, and because of that and regulatory issues that, are, that it drives, we usually see markets turn completely, from, completely to ethanol when they turn and create a very limited flexibility in our fuels infrastructure. Agricultural and rural impact, we need lots of biomass. We've talked about the tonnage that's required. That's the hardest thing, you know, we've, I find in my speaking for most people to fathom is the enormity of the fuels market. 140 billion gallons a year of gasoline in the U.S., 60 billion gallons a year of diesel fuel, Tremendous capital employed, tremendous economies of scale required to get get the costs down in the level that that we're frankly familiar and expect from from the marketplace when we when we fill up our vehicles today. But getting there requires that potentially changing crop types. How how do we convince a farmer to go from planting wheat to planting switchgrass, a crop with an entirely different cash flow that requires multiple years as opposed to getting the cash back at the next harvest and the issues we need to work. Farming practices to, to maximize the sustainability and, and or maximizing yield. Using the land that's currently underutilized today because we need so much stuff, we need so much biomass and many other issues, in addition to green, greenhouse gases, environmental sustainability, or how do we produce the fuels, the standards, both, both from an environmental standpoint for sustainability in terms of land use, biodiversity, and emissions, and, and social and ethical issues involved in increasing and transforming economies in the developing world. Watch what ills we create when we try to dra drastically change economies in un lesser developed countries too quickly. Things we have to be very thoughtful about and very mindful of how we get there. So, now I can think about what, what is BP doing? Some of the things that we're up to is we need, we're looking for advanced biofuels going beyond the current generation to fuels that respond to the greenhouse gas needs, security of supply, and agricultural support. One of the things we've landed on is biobutanol for several reasons. One, it's produced from the same feedstocks as ethanol with minimal process modifications. So it isn't, it isn't a big change to the industry to do it. It does, the farmers should be, should be unimpacted by it. We aren't threat, trying to avoid threatening the vested interests in, in ethanol because we can work with them. We're not going to, we're not, it's not biobutanol versus ethanol. That's one thing I want to make very clear. Biobutanol works with ethanol. It works with the resources that are currently invested in ethanol. 
but it has advantages. It can be blended into gasoline at the refinery because it doesn't have the water solubility issues that ethanol has. So we can get the three and a half cent per gallon pipeline transit cost instead of the truck and rail transit costs and reliability issues that are, that are involved with ethanol. We can, we can use existing tanks, we can use existing dispensers because we don't have material compatibility issues that ethanol creates. We can blend in existing vehicles the 95% or so of vehicles that don't change every year. We can, we can blend higher levels than ethanol in existing vehicles and get, make more of a difference sooner. The fleet turns over very slowly. Making a big difference fast requires that we focus on the vehicles that are on the road today, that we focus on the infrastructure that's in place today. Long time run solutions we need to work on too, but we've got a, we've got a big problem and we need to work quickly. How we, do, how we go about it can make a big difference. The energy content closer to gasoline. We don't have the range reduction issues at, as severe as you do with ethanol, with butanol. In addition, you can blend butanol and ethanol together. Gives, gives you some additional benefits. It helps mitigate the vapor pressure concerns of ethanol. It helps mitigate the water solubility concerns of ethanol. So a lot of good things going on with butanol. There, is this the final answer? I don't know. I suspect we'll keep working at this and we'll find more answers as we go forward. All the more reason why we don't want to lock in on a single molecule today. So, commercial for BP biofuels. We announced the formation of a new biofuels business in June with many streams of activity associated with it. And he said, got the headline is we'll be funding $500 million over 10 years for the Energy Biosciences Institute. Be located at a university somewhere in the U.S. or the U.K. A selection process is currently in place. <laughs> to apply to the fuels industry, the advances in biosciences that have been so successfully applied to the pharmaceutical industry and to the, and to the food industry. Working with DuPont on biobutanol because we want to get that breakthrough. We think, we think there's economics there. We think there's value there. We think it's a serious fuel. We're working together with British Sugar in the UK for our first commercial introduction. Time to, time to be determined right now. Additionally, reaching our ends requires more than just the fuel. Mm -hmm. It requires action on CO2 emissions as well. And so we've launched Target Neutral last month in the UK a way to get cons offer consumers an opportunity to offset their CO2 emissions. So some of that it will be getting, getting serious reductions in CO2 from, from a percentage of consumers that will respond to it. Probably even more importantly is the educational message that we get, that people have responsibility for their actions, that people can do something about it, and so that individuals can think about what their carbon footprint looks like. Mm, quick summary, what, what is BP doing around the world in biofuels? In the U.S., we've been using ethanol for over 25 years, as long as any of the major oil companies in the U.S., and we believe we're the largest user of ethanol in the U.S. and probably the world. Used 575 million gallons of ethanol last year in the U.S. out of the roughly four billion that were, that were produced in the U.S. We added 20 new markets voluntarily last year because it was good business sense for us to do that. We've added a number more this year with MTBE phase out and more will keep, more will keep coming as the, as the business and the regulations require us to do so. Today we're doing a little bit with biodiesel we expect that to be growing considerably over the next several years. 
the Energy Biosciences Institute, EBI, to be determined. Target Neutral, our CO2 offset program that we launched in the UK, it'll go, we plan on taking it beyond the UK as we, as we see what messages work with different consumers in different marketplaces. Some of our, going around the globe here, some of the earlier speakers talked about Jatropha. We're spending $9 million in India learning about Jatropha, working with a partner there to grow, learn what, what does it take to grow Jatropha successfully. A non-edible crop that grows on marginal land that isn't suitable for conventional agriculture. Help us, a, a product that's comparable to soy in, pro, in quality for making biodiesel. We're trying to learn more about it, see if there's, see how we can have that play a bigger role in the fuels market. In Australia, we've announced contracts to supply ethan, ethanol blended gasoline in, in excess of the uh, Australian requirement for the country as a whole. In addition, we're working on producing renewable diesel from TALO, working with our refinery in, in Brisbane, Australia greatly expanding the pool of these renewable diesel present and in the market in Australia over the next few years. Our concerns about sustainability, in particular in concerns with concern of palm oil, we're, work, we're actively engaged in the roundtable for sustainable palm oil production in, in Asia. In Europe, of course, we were the first major to introduce 5% biodiesel blends in, in Germany, I believe we're the largest blender of biodiesel in, the, in Europe. Rapidly moving out of MTBE and bringing in ethanol and an ETBE. And target neutral, we've, we've talked about. Summary, but many issues remain to be worked on biodiesel, many things to do, but a very promising future ahead. BP is focused. I'm, I'm making biofuels, very real fuels, very serious fuels. Thank you. Have some uh, questions? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in the past, when I used to meet uh, my BP friends uh, and ask them, what do you really mean by beyond petroleum? The standard answer was always on solar. There was never a mention of uh, liquid fuel. So I'm gratified to see that you have moved uh, into this arena. But the question I have is, I suppose the butanol that you're talking about comes from uh, acetone butanol fermentation. If that is the case, what do you do with the acetone? Um, yeah, the acetone butanol, the ABE process is process that's available in the near term. Um, we don't think that that process is economically viable and we're looking for a different process and that's an area where DuPont is working hard on developing the process use, using it, it, genetically modified bacteria to produce it similar to what they've done with 1,3-propane uh, diol for, for chemicals. Do do you, uh, does BP and DuPont, do they believe that through use of genetically modified bacteria that may be, let's just put it this way, does, does it look economically viable in a closed system? We're putting a lot of resource in it. We, we expect that we, it has to be sustainable right. economically before, for, for it to be a good business for us. Okay, let's get a sugar high and then come back in about 10 minutes.